The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled How I Think, How I Treat, Understanding and Working with New Immunotherapeutic and Targeted Management Models in Advanced RCC. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash KWJ860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hi, everyone, and thank you for being here for this um, Peerview Live event about how we think and how we treat and work with novel immunotherapy and targeted therapy in advanced uh, RCC. I want to thank the Kidney Cancer um, Association for this peer view program and the two presenters, Dr. Hans Hammers from UT Southwestern and Dr. Raina McKay from University of California, San Diego. So this is today's agenda, how we think, how we treat renal cell and insight into the important issues with immunotherapy and TKI in RCC care. We're going to cover the dual checkpoint blockade with nivolumab, ipilimumab, the IO and TKI uh, combination regimen, then over 15 minutes I'm going to talk about some uh, sequential use of immune checkpoint inhibitor, TKI, and most of the recent data really from ASCO and ESMO with uh, novel drug and mechanism of action. Having said so, my honor to present the first speaker, my good friend Dr. Hans Hammers from UT Southwestern who will tackle dual immunotherapy combination in frontline renal cell cancer. So um, combination immunotherapy um, with nivolumab, ipilimumab, two different um, antibodies targeting and manipulating the immune system. And um, one of the targets is CTLF-4. CTLF-4 is really important for signal number two in the initial stimulation priming of the immune response. So you get specificity from the T cell receptor, but the interaction of B7, CD28 is really important to essentially amplify uh, the initial priming and the immune response. CTLF4 is a negative uh, factor, and that one is targeted by uh, epilimumab, and this was worked by Jim Allison, uh, which led to the uh, Nobel Prize uh, last year. Uh, this is uh, enter PD1. Enter PD1 may be a little bit more restrictive with regards to where it acts. So CTLF4 is more broadly acting. Secondary lymphoid organs also has an effect on T regulatory cells, but enter PD1 is probably a little bit more restricted to the tumor microenvironment and is really important for um, the late phase of the um, effector response. So Checkmate 214 um, changed the landscape in 2018, uh, was pitted against sunitinib, was a very interesting study that accrued um, all kinds of risk patients, but really the primary analysis was restricted uh, for um, registration to intermediate and poorest disease. Uh, the alpha was split across um, three different primary endpoints of PFSOS, and objective response rate um, and uh, led to the approval um, in intermediate and poorest renal cell carcinoma. This is some updated data. Um, this is the overall survival in the intent to treat analysis. So all patients uh, combined, if there hadn't been this more sophisticated approach, you know, maybe even this data set would have led to the approval across uh, all the different uh, risk groups. The reason why I circled at the beginning of the overall survival curve is that we sometimes forget that in other diseases, that particular part of the survival curve looks different. So if you look at lung cancer, for example, or bladder cancer, if you just use pure immunotherapy, you may see an initial dip uh, in the overall survival curve, indicating that some patients may need some additional therapy um, up front. We actually don't see that in renal cell carcinoma. So I would say, it's not the strongest argument that you have to combine um, immunotherapy, in particular combination immunotherapy, always up front with VEGF inhibitors. Nonetheless, there are some patients who will certainly benefit from, let's say, triple therapy or double therapy with the VEGF inhibitor. So um, very good um, hazard ratio um, and uh, statistically significant. This is the overall survival curve broken down by the intermittent poorest disease um, and, and with a very nice hazard ratio of 0.66. And in favorable risk group, um, we really don't see statistical significance, but we actually don't see that for any combination. The truth is favorable risk patients do well no matter what you do, and it's very difficult to show actually survival benefit uh, in good risk uh, patients. Um, this is a progression-free survival across all patients. You don't see any difference, so to say, just by number. Median progression-free survival is 9.7, but um, if you then follow the curves, you can clearly see them breaking apart 
and you may see something that looks like a tail um, of the curve in the range of 28%, which is actually quite impressive. So again, a median progression-free survival may not be the best way to analyze these um, curves, um, but the tail is maybe more important than other maybe statistical uh, measures. This was one of my favorite figures of um, GEO ESCO 2019, uh, where we see, again, this nice tail forming in patients in the uh, progression-free survival curves, indicating that some patients do um, very well. Um, that curve does not look as good with regards to favorable risk, but we know that sunitinib probably overperformed in that uh, particular cohort of patients. Pay attention to the ongoing CR. So uh, let's look at the quality of the response. On the very left, you see the response rate by ITT population, middle is intermediate, and poorest risk is favorable risk. And then you can see that in blue, the CRs typically are quite nicely durable and ongoing with 30 month um, follow up versus the patients who achieved CRs on sunitinib have less uh, durability of those uh, responses. In fact, there's a poster out here uh, by Victor Grunwald. He looked at that. You may not need a CR to have these very durable responses. Even a deep response can probably be as good as a CR. This is uh, the response rate broken down by um, risk factors. So this 30-month uh, update um, is really uh, investigator um, assessed, so there's a difference there, and there's some, probably some discrepancy uh, in the favorable risk group, but the truth is if the investigators themselves looked at it, there was not really much of a difference with regards to response rate among patients who have zero risk factors, i.e. favorable risk patients, and patients with increasing risk factors on the immunotherapy side to your left. But you can see a very nice dependence on the number of risk factors and the efficacy of these agents <coughs> in um, uh, VEGF-treated patients, indicating that maybe the IMDC risk factors, these clinical tools that we use, uh, are maybe better suitable to identify patients on the VEGF side rather than immunotherapy side. Um, this is a treatment-free survival. This is um, unique for this regimen because either when you stopped immunotherapy because of a side effect, or let's say you completed your two years of immunotherapy, um, there are patients who can be completely treatment-free. Um, these are patients who discontinued therapy for various reasons. And if you look at the landmark analysis, there's a subset of patients, roughly 20%, who are still treatment-free, meaning they did not need to proceed to another second-line therapy, um, roughly 20% at uh, two years, which I think is quite remarkable. And Dave McDermott and others um, have uh, put quite some effort into this, looking at this data set. There's another way of uh, depicting it. So um, on the very top, you see patients who are off therapy and never received a subsequent therapy. And you can see that block is clearly larger for nivolumab, epilimumab in, in blue with ongoing uh, uh, responses. Uh, Checkmate 214, these are the um, patient reported outcomes. And I think the, one of the very unique features is the quality of life and I think it's actually unmatched. Uh, despite all the discussions about the side effects, et cetera, and we're scaring our patients sometimes with some of these side effect discussions, patients do really well. If they get colitis, they hepatitis, that's steroids, typically limited to a few days um, uh, with regards to improvement in some of these symptoms, um, and the patients overall do really well. That's something that we do not see in the VEGF uh, combination. So quality of life is unmatched uh, for this particular combination. Just an illustration that really most of the side effects of NEVOAP that we're worried about really happen in the first few months. And the way I explain to patients is you're gonna invest three to four months of your time that you have to be a little bit closer to our hip, report side effects, et cetera. But then typically you're done. And all the side effects that were meant to happen um, have happened and then you can essentially just uh, ride along uh, PD-1 monotherapy, typically without um, major upsets subset of patients that we used to be very worried about, patients with sarcomatoid differentiation um, do really well with immunotherapy. Dr. Cherry and others have done studies looking at the expression of pdl one for example, in sarcomatoid patients. Very high percentage of patients have this um, enrichment uh, marker, if you will, for an ongoing or uh, pre-established immune response. And as you can see, the response rate is outstanding. 56% response rate with 18% uh, CRs in sarcomatoid renal cell carcinoma, and that is really um, a game changer for this particular subset of patients. 
Um, if you look at the PFS curve, those um, uh, responses um, appear to be uh, durable with ongoing uh, PFS and the tail forming at the end. This is one of my um, favorite slides. It's really a comparison with regards to progression-free survival curves with long-term follow-up and emerging long-term follow-up for Checkmate 025, which is PD-1 monotherapy. And the truth is, if you look at patients who were exposed to PD-1 monotherapy after TKI, you can see that despite the initial response rate of 21-25%, you will see that most patients eventually progress um, and will need uh, subsequent therapy. So really the a number of patients who don't require further therapy is in the single digits. That might be different if you add a polymomab. So my sense is, at least from the curve so far, is that maybe we have a higher chance of finding a potential plateau uh, by the addition of epilimumab, and I think that is something to watch as the data matures for, for example, TKI-PD-1 uh, uh, combinations. This is a selection of some of the ongoing uh, phase three trials. Tian Zhang, who's leading, uh, together with Tony, the efforts on the pedigree trial, essentially looking at intensifying a benefit um, in patients who had just stable disease, um, after nivolumab, epilimumab, with the addition of carbozentinib, triple therapy, adding a potent VEGF TKI uh, to nivolumab, um, epilimumab, and then a study that combines PD-1 inhibition with uh, a pegylated cytokine. All very interesting studies. They can change the way we treat the kidney cancer. How do I think and how do I treat uh, kidney cancer? To me, um, IOIO is the most potent immunotherapy that I couldn't deliver in uh, 2019, clearly durable responses and treatment-free survival are benefits that stand out to me. I do have the bias that we may need the CTLA-4 component to get these durable responses um, that may um, um, uh, lead patients to potentially discontinuing therapy um, for longer periods of time. I do reserve IO and TKI combinations for patients when an objective response rate is absolutely critical. Um, large volume tumor burden, highly symptomatic patients where I need a response now, um, or the triplets are coming, quite frankly, off label, um, have I added excitinib to Nevo APS? I've done so. Um, so, um, again, consider IO, IO, even for patients actually with IO and TKI uh, progression. So, there's some data emerging from retrospective series. Uh, Dr. Rini, et cetera, is working on some of those data sets where there is activity um, of uh, PD-1 CTLA-4 combination after progression on uh, PD-1 monotherapy. Uh, nonetheless, there is clearly a need for education. Um, I spend a good amount of time educating patients, um, set the stage to, to um, timely report uh, side effects, uh, but also providers. We sometimes do see things in the community um, that I probably would not have done. Um, but I think the word is spreading and um, uh, physicians and emergency rooms are getting better. I do have a frank discussion about the need for steroids. The way I think about it, IOIO, roughly 35% of patients will end up on high doses of um, steroids with steroid taper and roughly 15% of patients will need to do so for PD-1 um, monotherapy. But yet, despite the IRAEs that we're worried about, the quality of life is simply unmatched. Um, however, um, if you slap a TKI to immunotherapy, you may also lose some information. So um, we do observe heterogeneity in the response, and that is something that we may build on in the future. For, and I do feel that IO is actually a good backbone uh, for more comprehensive immunotherapy approaches. All right, so the other side of the coin, discussing uh, how I use immunotherapy TKI combinations for advanced RCCs. Preclinical and clinical um, uh, data suggest that VEGF inhibition very well may be synergistic with immune checkpoint blockade. We know that immune checkpoint blockade activate the host immune system by blocking negative regulatory uh, immune signals within the tumor. We know that VEGF can stimulate an immunosuppressive microenvironment and blockade can augment the tumor microenvironment. Here we highlight the first line um, phase three combinations of anti-VEGF agents with immunotherapy for advanced RCC, starting with the Emotion 151 trial, looking at the combination of bevacizumab plus atezolizumab. 
the two um, IO VEGF um, trials, Javelin Renal 101, looking at excitinib plus avulimab, and Keynote 426, looking at excitinib and pembrolizumab, both of which leading to FDA approvals in the U.S., and we're eagerly awaiting the results of Checkmate 9ER, looking at the combination of nivolumab plus cabozantinib, the CLEAR trial looking at LEMPEM in this space, and also COSMIC 313 looking at triplicates, um, which are certainly going to augment the treatment landscape in the future for um, advanced RCC. Here is the study design for Keynote 426. Um, it was a randomized phase three trial looking at the combination of Pembro-Axi um, compared to sunitinib with a dual primary endpoint of OS and PFS as assessed by independent review in the intent to treat population. Here is the top level um, progression-free survival curve um, for the intent to treat population, resulting in a statistically significant difference in PFS with the combination of Pembro-Axi over sunitinib um, with a median PFS of 15.1 months um, with Pembro-Axi and 11.1 months with sunitinib with a hazard ratio of 0.69. And you can see the um, landmark analyses there at 12 and 18 months. And here is the overall survival um, Kaplan-Meier curve. The median is not reached for either arm, but there's a clear separation of the curves favoring pembrolizumab plus excitinib um, over sunitinib with a striking hazard ratio of 0.53. And again, looking at 12-month and 18-month landmark analyses with 82% um, of patients still alive at 18 months compared to 72% uh, with um, sunitinib. Clearly, practice changing data. And looking at the response data, you know, also striking, you know, we're getting responses up to 60% with the combination of pembrolizumab plus excitinib compared to 35.7% with sunitinib. And then I'll draw your attention to the um, complete response rate at 5.8% with the combination of Pembro plus Axi. And um, uh, looking at the durability of response, here's the median, which is not yet reached. Our post hoc analysis was conducted in those with sarcomatoid um, features, showing a clear benefit of pembroaxi and over sunitinib. Um, this is uh, uh, the PFS curve with a hazard ratio of 0.54. Again, this is a retrospective post hoc analysis, but a signal of efficacy with the combination of pembroaxi over sunitinib. And here is the breakdown um, by uh, IMDC intermediate poor risk disease across all three efficacy parameters of OS, PFS, and objective response, showing a clear benefit of um, Pembroaxi over sunitinib across these three efficacy parameters. Now, I think it's important to talk about treatment-related adverse events, and as we compare um, uh, Pembroaxi to sunitinib, we see that actually the um, side effect profile of treatment emergent AEs is almost comparable to that of sunitinib. But the grade three five toxicity is in dark uh, navy here. It seems to be a little bit um, higher with regards to diarrhea, and also the ALT ASD um, elevation is a little bit higher with Pembroaxi compared to sunitinib. And then when we look at treatment-related AEs that led to discontinuation of uh, any treatment, a little bit higher with um, uh, uh, PEMAXI, obviously it's a doublet, um, and also treatment-related AEs leading to uh, interruption of any treatment, higher with um, PEMAXI at 62% compared to 40 with sunetinib. All right, moving along, we'll talk about Javelin Renal 101. Um, this is the study design, a randomized phase three trial, randomizing patients to the uh, combination of Vulimab plus excitinib um, compared to sunitinib with a co-primary endpoint of PFS and OS in PDL one positive patients. Here's the top level data. This obviously was a positive study, resulting in a clear benefit of PFS in PDL1 positive patients by independent radiology review. Um, with the combination of avulimab plus excitinib, the PFS was 13.8 months, um, with sunitinib at 7.2 months, with a hazard ratio of 0.61, which was statistically significant. Um, when we look at the overall uh, population, we see that the curves continue to separate, and this is maintained really across um, uh, the entire uh, trial population. So this is the um, uh, PFS subgroup analysis with this forest plot reflecting um, a clear benefit of uh, avulimab excitinib um, uh, really across all subgroups. And you can see here with regards to the IMDC um, favorable intermediate and poor risk, the point estimates are clearly favoring excitinib and a uh, uh, avulimab, and actually the confidence interval here for all three subgroups is actually, um, you know, uh, on the other side of the one here. 
With regards to responses, um, response rate um, clearly higher with the combination of exitinib and avulumab, um, objective response at 55% in PDL1 positive patients and 51% in the overall population, compared to around 26% with sunitinib in both PDL1 positive and the overall population. Looking at the complete response rate, it's about 4% here with the combination um, in PDL1 positive patients and 3% in the total population. And just highlighting toxicity with the combination and focusing on the treatment-related AEs, primarily the grade three and uh, four AEs, about 55% in both um, the combination arm and in um, the student of treated patients. A little bit higher um, hypertension with the combo here, cytopenias are worse off with the sunitinib as we've seen in clinical practice. And then focusing on AEs of special interest and primarily immune-related adverse events. Um, so all great immune-related adverse events were about 38% with a combination of avulumab plus exitinib, 9% um, a grade three, four toxicity. Um, looking at uh, the rate of patients who actually required high-dose keratoclosteroids, that was at 11%. Um, and also, uh, we do see some infusion-related reactions, 12%, most of these were low-grade um, and, uh, uh, you know, easy to manage. Lastly, we'll highlight the Phase three Emotion 151 trial, another Phase three randomized trial looking at the combination of atezolizumab plus bevacizumab um, uh, versus sunitinib. The co-primary endpoint of this trial was investigator-assessed PFS in patients with pdl one positive expression and also overall survival in the intent-to-treat population. This was a positive trial. Um, this is the uh, investigator-assessed PFS here, which was clearly superior with the combination of atezolizumab um, plus bevacizumab compared to sunitinib, a PFS of 11.2 months compared to 7.7 uh, 7 months in pdl one positive patients, which was statistically significant. And looking at the intent to treat population, we do observe the same um, uh, benefit that was also statistically significant. Uh, the objective response rate was 43% uh, um, with uh, the combination um, in the PDL1 positive patients and 37% in the intent to treat population. And another subgroup analysis was also conducted from this data set tabulating the case report forms regarding those who had uh, sarcomatoid histology, um, demonstrating a benefit with the combination um, uh, with regards to OS, PFS, and response rate compared to sunitinib, regardless of PDL1 status. Looking at the toxicity profiles, here's a pooled analysis from Emotion 150 and Emotion 151. And you can clearly see that the combination is actually fairly well tolerated um, uh, compared to uh, continuous uh, TKI. Um, there is a little bit more proteinuria that we see with the combination of atezo-bev, but um, uh, you know, less uh, all grade toxicity and grade three, four toxicity was less with the combo. When we look at um, uh, AEs that are requiring high-dose steroids, it was about 9% um, with the combination of atezolizumab plus bevacizumab. So how I think, how I treat, so the fusion of VEGF um, uh, inhibitors um, with PDL1, PD1 blockade really has produced impressive anti-tumor effects in the clinic. Objective responses and PFS are meaningful. I mean, we're getting responses, you know, greater than 50%, um, which is striking. The impact of Axipembro um, from Keynote 426 on overall survival really sets a, a new high bar um, with regards to future trials and really understanding the data um, as people are receiving uh, these therapies, whether it be frontline or use in, in later lines. Um, VEGF um, plus uh, checkpoint blockade um, are tolerable and broadly applicable, although the impact on quality of life really remains to be determined. These, these uh, regimens are not without a cost, as you can see from the uh, treatment-related AE data that we shared. You know, comparative data on IO-IO versus IO-VEGF combinations are currently lacking, and as combinations populate the front line, we're really left with a dilemma of what agent to pick. And right now, it's really up to um, the uh, treating clinician in close discussions with their patient on really identifying what's the right regimen for each individual patient. You know, based on risk stratification parameters, right now all we have are uh, clinical uh, uh, stratifying factors. Based on histology, we've seen the data regarding sarcomatoid and um, uh, how that may play into your decision making, safety profile, and what are the um, comorbidities that your patient may have, whether it be cardiovascular toxicity, autoimmune disease, um, and also the efficacy profiles of the regimens. You know, do you need an in immediate 
you know, cytoreductive response right away if you have somebody in um, a crisis. Um, so uh, that plays into your decision making. And while there's a lot of exciting, um, you know, biomarkers that are being explored, really this continues to be an unmet need. We continue to talk about biomarkers, um, but there's no actually uh, practical biomarker that we can use in the clinic for um, patient selection um, and helping tease out which regimen to use and, and which patient may benefit better from VEGF inhibition alone, VEGF IO combo or IO IO combinations. And I think we still need, uh, we have some work to do with regards to teasing that out. I'm going to talk about what wasn't covered, including some um, uh, insight from uh, the last ESMO meeting and some update. So these are some um, insight that are shaping up how we treat renal cell cancer. This is the latest as of November 11, 2019, how the NCCN is approaching um, overall um, untreated renal cell cancer. You used to have what we call a salad of uh, uh, options. This is a bit more organized now in terms of what are the preferred regimen, not just the categories, the other recommended regimen and the useful regimen under certain situation and really based on the strength of evidence. So you see here the axi Pembro and the favorable followed by the axi Avilumab despite both positive because of the overall survival benefit of these patients. And you see here category one, Nevo and Ipic, the axi Pembro compared to uh, Cabo, for example, uh, which 2A by default based on the overall survival benefit. And the second line or later, also depending on the phase three trial and how the endpoint is met, favoring always uh, overall survival. This was covered briefly by Hans and Rana, but just to tell you, these are retrospective studies. The majority are of them, some exceptions, such as the study by Dr. Ornstein, that shows at least two things. One, the side effects of TKI post-IO are not amplified. And second, there is activity ranging between 13 and 41%. Uh, this is the first evidence of using single agent PD-1 after single agent PD-1, PD-L1 um, from our institution with Dylan Martini showing in three patients treated with nivolumab there was no responses after they progressed on prior PD-1 based um, regimen. Maybe a different here if you do nivolumab and ipilimumab possibly because of the combination, but very possibly because of uh, ipilimumab single agent activity that we know from Yang et al. long time ago from the NCI, ipilimumab does have single agent activity in renal cell carcinoma. Cabozentinib here in a study led by Dr. McGregor, uh, 86 patient, uh, showed um, response rate in patient uh, post-checkpoint blocker, 36% overall uh, response rate, and a time to treatment failure um, of 7.4 months. This is the study I talked about, uh, Dr. Ornstein here, showing excitinib activity after prior PD-1, PD-L1 therapy. It's a phase two uh, trial. Interesting thing here about um, the freedom of the investigator to really those uh, excitinib um, really response rate over 40% with PFS of 8.8 .8 months, suggesting activity. The breakpoint study with cabozentinib over IO is going with QCP uh, Procopio here, uh, showing cabozentinib. So what we saw at ESMO, uh, we saw um, the first study here that look at adding the CTLA-4 after nivolumab response. We have two other that will come. One was Dr. Atkins and Hammers called the HCRN study, and one was Dr. McKay and Harshman here uh, called the omnivore study. But Titan was the first where patients get nivolumab, and based on the response, if they have CR or PR, they go into maintenance. But if they have SD or PD, they get two doses of IP. If they move to CRPR, that's great, maintenance. If not, not they get um, the two other dose of IPI. So IPI boost one, IPI boost two. In first line, in untreated patients, second line meaning post-TKI, there is a consistently 10% increase in response rate. And PR and NIVO alone, 28%. That is higher than the response rate based on 009 study reported in 25 patients in 2015 of 13%. So really, this is 28%. Uh, up to 37%, 18 up to 28% when you add um, ipilimumab. The one thing I'm noticing here, and perhaps this is a bit early in the course, the medium follow-up will be relatively short, is the rate of CR that we see with nivolumab, ipilimumab, between 10 and 11% we did not uh, see here. 
So in terms of summary, boosting the response rate in first line and second line by 10 uh, percent, no new safety signal is very important and we really need to wait hopefully in the next meeting or two results from Omnivore and from HCRN study. And again a reminder the importance of sequencing here in a systematic fashion. This is from Dr. Zhang of uh, Duke, the pedigree study. Uh, which is again also response adapted where patient w untreated with metastatic RCC of intermediate or poor risk based on the stratification both the bone metastasis we know from Dr. McKay's work how important bone metastasis as an adverse prognostic factor and the IMDC intermediate and poor get nivolumab and ipilimumab assuming the response rate is 10 percent they get into maintenance um, if they have progression they get cabozentinib uh, in a 70%, we think, that will have PR or stable disease get randomized to standard nivolumab maintenance versus nivolumab and adding cabozentinib. The study accrued. We have over 30 patients on, and it's at this point U.S.-based study, but we're looking at uh, sites outside the U.S. A data of levantinib and uh, pembrolizumab after prior checkpoint uh, inhibitor here showing uh, uh, responses without a lymvatinib only arm it's hard to know uh, who responded but no doubt at least the safety of IO post IO and the fact that the response rate which seems from um, historical control and in indirect fashion higher what would you expect with lymvatinib alone is actually uh, promising. Some update on adjuvant therapy here, setting the stage for how the future should be. The well-awaited source trial that started actually in my fellowship um, randomized 1,711 patients under the leadership of Dr. Tim Eisen, and kudos to Tim for um, staying you know, patient uh, with this study, as actually we expected with the other four adjuvant trial of uh, TKI, there was no survival benefit. Here, the agent that was used is sorafenib, one-year sorafenib, three-year sorafenib, or placebo. Not just no overall survival benefit, but no disease-free survival benefit between the one-year or the three-year uh, arm to suggest any benefit from VEGF, uh, TKI, sorafenib. And I think the future will be the next generation of adjuvant uh, studies here. Um, uh, two, if you want, academic studies, uh, PROSPER and RAMPART, and uh, in addition, EMOTION 10, 564, and 914, testing adjuvant um, uh, checkpoint blocker in high-risk renal cell uh, carcinoma. Uh, PROSPER study led by Dr. Uh, Lauren Harshman and Allah um, randomizes patient to um, no treatment, so there is no placebo here, or neoadjuvant followed by adjuvant, priming the tumor, and it allows non-clear cell RCC. Emotion 10 and 564, very similar, clear cell RCC with or without sarcomatoid feature, get a year of atezolizumab or pembrolizumab. Rampart is the UK um, led study with Dr. Um, uh, Larkin and Dr. Uh, Powell's that test dual inhibition of uh, PDL1 and CTLA4 with Derva Tremi versus Derva only versus observation and also allows non clear cell. The study started accruing, or here an abbreviated regimen, if you want, of six months of CTLA4 and PD1. Dr. Mozer leading the study with nivolumab and ipilimumab. All the primary endpoints are disease-free survival, except for Rampart. Co-primary is disease-free survival, overall survival. But I would argue that these studies are large enough that they should show some overall survival uh, benefit. Uh, the next wave of therapies and a novel mechanism of action. So there is a novel uh, angiogenic inhibitor targeting endoglin and a randomized phase two study uh, with excitinib alone or excitinib and the endoglin inhibitor TRC-105 was negative. And another study actually with an antibody drug uh, conjugate, again, TIM-1 was also, didn't show um, um, you know, high response rate, even lower than uh, 10 percent. But two agents in particular with two mechanisms of action could be somewhat promising. Here, the telaglenostat, or I like to call it CB839, uh, is a glutaminase inhibitor. This is a mitochondrial enzyme, and the inhibitor obviously inhibits um, 
conversion of glutamine to glutamate here that will be used in the TCA cycle, and that inhibition really will slow down the rapidly proliferating cells. There is some elegant preclinical work uh, with the agent alone or in combination with Everolimus, the TOR inhibitor here, suggesting synergy. And at the same time, there was a small randomized phase two study ongoing uh, with uh, the Teglenostat and Everolimus versus Everolimus alone and heavily pretreated this patient. Dr. Lee again, who was at the podium many times at ESMO, presented the result of the study showing doubling of the progression-free survival. Obviously here, this is a low progression-free survival compared to historical control with um, Everolimus. But nevertheless, this is interesting, and I would think this is a proof of concept, especially that the combination was tolerated, uh, really uh, emphasizing also uh, that we need to know more about this and uh, be perhaps excited about the randomized the larger randomized phase two cantata, so entrata, and here cantata, which tests the same compound, the glanestats, the glutaminase inhibitor with cabozentinib versus cabozentinib alone. The study led by Dr. Tanir, a larger study that finished accrual and quite justified after the results here. So moving from the metabolic pathway to the Nobel Prize target, hypoxia, and the HIF2 inhibitor. So finally, um, a drug that can inhibit, um, you know, HIF2 directly, PT2977 or MK6482, uh, that can go into uh, a small binding pocket of HIF2 alpha. It's very hard to target these transcription factors. They do not have these friendly, um, you know, pockets for small molecule. But here, um, chemists at UT Southwestern were able, uh, with the first generation and the second generation, uh, to find this drug, and this was tested in renal cell cancer. Uh, remind you, the first study in, um, uh, was the first drug, PT2385, with Kevin Courtney showed a response rate of 13%. And now uh, the second study that was the first time presented at K IKCS in Croatia, and then Dr. Jonas uh, updated the result at ESMO in 55 heavily pretreated patients showing a response rate of 24%. And the median number of prior line of therapy was three, with 69% of patients experiencing tumor shrinkage, with a side effect profile that is different than the common VEGF inhibitor side effects, fatigue, diarrhea, and uh, hypertension, mostly around anemia, which is on target, managed with erythropoietin and um, uh, transfusion. So in conclusion from this update, again, adjuvant therapy is today mostly um, immune checkpoint inhibitor as part of trial if you have a study uh, open um, and TKI remains active following treatment with checkpoint inhibitor. We discussed a bit, the three of us here, sequencing uh, therapies and we discussed two potential promising targets around HIF2 and around the metabolic uh, pathway. And in my uh, opinion, renal cell cancer remained the most dynamic field in uro-oncology. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash KWJ860. This activity is supported through independent medical educational grants from Bristol Myers Squibb, Exelixis Incorporated, and Merkin Company Incorporated. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.